Welcome back to another edition of the Loudmouth MMA Podcast Network Breakdown Program. For those of you that joined us last week and listened to the new kind of installment of what we've got going on here at the Loudmouth MMA uh, Breakdown Show, uh, this is our second edition with this three-prong attack. Marcel Dorf been here since the beginning. Uh, AJ Shulo and yours truly, Davidson Baker, here for another breakdown. First of all, we'll ask you guys how we're doing. Marcel, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, man, but you asked me that five minutes before we started as well, so why asking again? Just kidding. So I'm that doing the people well, can know. So that the, <laughs> people, so that the people can know, bro. I'm doing well, man. Thanks for asking. Uh, how are you guys doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. AJ, yourself? Uh, good, just like you guys. Uh, four, four less fights. Uh, ready to go right th- through these with you guys. Yeah, man. 15 on the dock last week. We, uh, we spent quite a bit of time going through them. And, you know, before we get into, obviously, this weekend – Three round main event. We we do have some things to discuss. Obviously, uh, Brunson and Shabazian on the dock for the marquee on Saturday. Uh, however, I just wanted to touch on two things before we get started with the breakdown going into next week. Obviously, the main event over the weekend, Dar- uh, Darren Till looked great in the first round. Just want to ask you guys if you scored it any differently than forty eight forty seven. I had it forty eight forty seven for Robert Whitaker. Do either of you guys disagree? Marcel, you can go first. Oh, okay. Um, well, I had uh, I had a 48, 40. What what did I have? 48, 46. I think I scored 10 nine first round for for and I have to take for Till. Second yep. round 10 nine for Robert Whitaker. Third round 10 nine for Robert Whitaker. I scored an even in the fourth round. I scored the fifth round for Robert Whitaker. Fourth round was really close. I think the fourth round. Um, I think some people were even saying like there was a 10, eight in the second, just because of the, like the disparagement and like significant strikes. But I mean, I don't think Robert was so dominant in doing damage, but more so just in his position in the second round. AJ, did you have any, anything other than 48, 47 or somewhere around there? I had 48, 47, but for the, the other guy, I had it on oh, Darren wow. Till. Perhaps, uh, the fact that I had a bet on Darren Till perhaps swayed <laughs> by judgment. Uh, but it was one of those fights where like 48, 47 was like, it wasn't like egregious that Rob got it. Uh, I thought it could have been negotiable either way. Um, and as a fan, I'm really happy to see Rob bounce back. He's one of my favorite fighters in the game and, and see him in good spirits and get his hand raised in the octagon again. Nothing made me happier yeah. than seeing him uh, bounce back. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. It was good to see him win. I like Robert Whitaker, especially like with his personality right now. I, when they asked him about Chimaev after the fight, where he's like, can he, can he get the 170 pound belt first? Like before he comes up to 185 or blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, it's good to see Rob in good spirits. Lastly, before we get into the breakdown, because obviously I know that's what the purpose of this show is for, big news coming out today for the UFC. Habib Nurmagomedov, Justin Gaethje, official for UFC uh, 254, I believe, October 20th. So 255. Oh, yeah, 254 is two weeks before that, right? Yeah. Okay, two weeks before that will be 254, and then UFC 255 got its headliner today. Habib Nurmagomedov, Justin Gaethje, uh, AJ, I'll let you kick it off. Your uh, your reaction, then finally putting a date on it. Oh, I'm ecstatic about this fight. This is the fight to make for the lightweight strap, and uh, it's just that big question mark. Is Gaethje's takedown defense good enough to keep the fight standing against the dominant uh, takedown artist in Habib? It's a big question that I'm very curious um highly anticipated to see exactly how it plays out should be a fun one this is uh i think habib's actually one of if not his toughest test in the weight class i agree 100 percent. marcel do you um yeah i agree but i think Habib will win i think um yeah at the end of the day i think um i think Habib just he maybe has to overcome the first two rounds because gaethje keeps throwing we, we all know that but at a certain moment, Gaethje volume goes a little bit back. Not not too much because we saw it in the first fight. But it's gonna get a little back. And then when uh, when the how do you say the tired the tiredness? I can't find the word I have that so often. Uh, sorry guys, I'm not from um, English is not my first language, so sometimes I can't find the the, the right word. But uh, if that's happening, then I think Khabib can take him down at will. So uh, yeah, that's what I think. It should be it, it should be interesting. I thought it was very interesting that of all outlets, it was CNN to get their hands on that golden little scoop right there. However, we digress and we move along, going upward. By the way, I'm hearing post- CNN often as fake news. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> that's that's according to one particularly <laughs> tinted skinned man, and we'll go ahead and and, and leave it at that. <laughs> um, as you know, if you listen to this program or any shows on the Loudmouth MMA Network, we go. 
well, backwards apropos to what normally uh, the normal order people go in. We start from the bottom and work our way up. And that starts at 135 pounds. It was originally Chris Gutierrez and Luke Sanders that were going to get things going at 135 pounds here. But Cody Durden stepping in on short notice. Man, Chris Gutierrez has looked very good as of recently after his debut loss to Hani Barcelos. Marcel, I'll let you kick this one off. Thank you. Um, yeah, Chris Gutierrez uh, looked very good, definitely with that last uh, win against uh, Vince Morales with those uh, leg kicks, man. It was amazing. Uh, he, he won three straight against Ryan McDonald, Geraldo de Freitas, and Vince Morales. I think the Ryan McDonald fight, that was so t- so dominant, what I can remember. The de Freitas fight was close, but I think he deserved the win, and the Morales fight was basically his coming out party for, let's say, the people who don't watch MMA often, I think. That's that's for sure. He's fighting, uh, he's a factor reality guy, by the way. He's fighting Cody Durden, who trains at the American Top Team Atlanta with the Lima Brothers. Um, good fighter, man, I think. Um, uh, in the regional scene, did very well. I got the Vela title. Um, only, only two losses against uh, against tough competition in the uh, Jared Scoggins and Ryan Hollis. Um Man, I have to pick Gutierrez in this one, man. I think uh, it's it's too much of a risk to uh, take a newcomer on short notice. I, th- I know he has a big win streak, but I kind of think Gutierrez is the toughest test he has faced so far. So uh, I'm definitely going with uh, Chris Gutierrez in this one, probably via decision. Maybe too much too soon for the newcomer, Durden, who, as you said, does train alongside some very well-known training partners down in Georgia. Uh, Mr. Shulo, your opinion. Yeah, this is an interesting one. Chris Gutierrez, minus 300. The comeback on uh, Cody here is plus 250. This is very interesting because I would actually pick Chris to beat a lot of the fighters in this weight class in a purely strikers battle. Uh, He just showcased that his last fight. He's got a varied attack. He attacks the cap kick really well. He's technical. He gauges distance. He's got very good footwork. So many boxes are checked with the the striking of Chris. But if you want to give him the most resistance in a fight, it's going to come through the takedown. Uh, that's evident in, you know, his loss and even the fight against DeFreitas that went to a split decision. He struggles with the takedown game of the opposing fighters. And Cody, from what I could tell, he's a pretty good wrestler, relentless with the attack. Um, like you mentioned, though, this is an unfavorable circumstance coming in here and replacing Luke Sanders on very short notice, the UFC debut. The interesting thing, though, is Cody's actually fought twice in 2020, and one of those bouts came just a few days ago. July 18th to be exact. So very, very interesting. Despite the fact that this is a short notice fight for him, he does present a an interesting uh, stylistic matchup to Chris and that, you know, the takedown game is what he struggled with the most. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Cody make it competitive. Obviously, I understand Chris being the favorite just due to the more favorable circumstances, the more experienced guy in there. But this is an interesting one, truly a striker versus wrestler matchup. You know, Gutierrez, as as indicated earlier, I, I think is on a roll right now. I think that role will probably tend to continue. Um, and before we roll out these picks, obviously starting here with the first one here, score is 12 and three for Mr. Marcel to an unfavorable nine and six for Mr. Baker. Davidson, three games back off the pace to start things off. But we both have Gutierrez here. This next fight here is my... You know, last week we were kind of gushing about Evloyev and Grundy on the prelims. I think this one is kind of right up there, too. I love both of these guys. Pure talent levels. Uh, Emers has kind of been hovering around the UFC for some time. Um, I think a lot of people expected him to best Julian Arosa on the Contender Series. That obviously didn't happen. Valiev, too, um, a guy that most people assumed was going to be in the UFC for some time. Uh, AJ, your thoughts on this one at 145? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Emmers kind of reminds me of Lando Venata and Bobby Green that we'll get to later on. Like, talent-wise, the guy checks so many boxes. He's very talented. Love the skill set that the guy possesses. He's kind of like his own worst enemy inside the octagon, though. And what I mean by that is sometimes he just doesn't always fight with the most urgency. You know, the UFC mm-hmm. debut against Giga Chikadze didn't go to the takedown game as, you know, uh, persistently as you'd like him to, considering he had a, a massive wrestling and grappling advantage there. It was a little concerning. Uh, in addition to that, you mentioned the Julian Arosa fight. There are times when he uh, gets o- over eager on the feet. You know, he's uh, can be vulnerable at times against a good technical striker. He can be uh, hurt on the feet as well. So it's an interesting matchup. Emmers will be the longer guy here per tapology. He's got a six inch reach advantage, and I do tend to favor him in a purely strikers battle at range. Uh, Timur Valiev is a gentleman who uh, has come from PFL. Uh, I do think he's a good wrestler. He definitely could strike very well. 
but the uh, size and length advantage of Emers could definitely give Timor some resistance here. Um, and I don't think the takedowns will come easy for Timor. So I tend to think that, you know, this fight being close and competitive is indicative of the fact that like, hey, Emers and Timor are very talented fighters, but sometimes, uh, you know, Emers not fighting up to what we would hope for on a fight to fight basis kind of uh, indicates that, hey, these odds can be competitive. If not, Emers could best some of the exchanges here, given he shows up at his best. Marcel, I think this fight was is at 145, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was maybe being talked about at 135, but is it 145? Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, Valiev took this fight. Uh, let's say also Amherst, but Valiev took it on short notice, and he's normally a 135er, but he can't make 135 at this moment on short notice, so that's why it's 145. Um, yeah, Amherst, I like him a lot. I think um, uh, he has some he has some incredible names on his record as well, like Corey Santagen, for example. Um, his loss against Giga Shikadze was a split decision. I kind of feel like it could have been another way as well, the other way around. I think it was very close. Um, Timur Valiev, um, I, I, I'm big on Valiev, man. I like him. I think he's a good fighter. He's, he's very good on the ground. Um, it's hard because it's a weight class up, you know, so... I would always say Valiev normally if it was a 35, but Amherst can't make 35, it's 45. I still think Valiev uh, is a more talented fighter than Amherst, so I'm going with Valiev via split decision. I don't know, split decision, a close fight. I think it's going to be really close too, and this one has given me fits for sure. I'm going to stick with Marcel here on this one, though. I like Valiev as well. I think he gets it done and comes in on short notice. Um, you'd have to think, man, too. Emmer's one of the more talented fighters in recent memory to, to kick off his UFC career 0-2, in my opinion. Um, at 185 pounds, we go upwards. Eric Spicely is looking to continue a positive trajectory in his UFC reboot. Uh, even though his first fight came in a losing effort against Deron Wynn, man, I'm sure I speak for the rest of us when I say I had a blast watching that fight. Uh, yeah, first fight back, man, it was so awesome. He and Marcus Perez... We'll get things going here at 185. Marcel, go ahead. Yeah, like you said, man, that was a fun fight. It was the first fight of the prelims and got fight of the night. Says it all, I guess. Um, yeah, Eric Spicely, uh, second run in the UFC. He went to uh, CES after he got cut. Uh, won two fights against uh, against Kyle Magalash, which is a very good fighter, in my opinion. Also uh, in the former UFC fighter. Um Lost to Darren Wynn, now fighting Marcus Perez. Marcus Perez with uh, the Joker imitation in his last fight against Wellington Terman. Uh, got defeated, which I didn't expect it at that moment. But, but, uh, before that, he, lo- he won against Anthony Hernandez via a very impressive anaconda choke. The thing is, with uh, Marcus Perez, if he gets that level up, he, he doesn't show up, in my opinion. But Eric Spicely, is that the level up? I don't know. I think they are really a really competitive match here. Um... If I go with my gut feeling, I say Marcus Perez catches Eric Spicely late in the third round with a submission. Ooh, this is an interesting grappling matchup, I think, because both of these guys have some serious BJJ credentials. Um, AJ, your thoughts? Yeah, they're both really good Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, and I just tend to think that Marcus is good enough defensively and tough and durable enough to withstand anything that Eric had throw at him. Um, Eric, you know, he tends to struggle in fights where he can't take fighters down and submit them in the UFC. That's evident in a lot of his wins and losses. Um, Obviously, he definitely held his own against Daron Wynn in his comeback fight to the UFC. But uh, this is a matchup where I do think that Perez could potentially just overwhelm Spicely down the stretch, attack the body, just kind of wear on the gas tank. Um, And probably like to Marcel's point, win by stoppage down the stretch. I do think that Prez is the more physical fighter, uh, the more agile fighter as well. I think we'll have the striking advantage. And I do tend to think that his takedown defense will be good enough to keep the fight standing the vast majority of the time. Um, If Spicely happens to get him down, I think that Prez, uh, again, with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu pedigree and being physical and strong enough, uh, should be able to make his way back to the feet intelligently, not give up his back, etc., and uh, probably win by stoppage down the stretch. So I certainly understand Prez being the current minus 200 favorite over uh, Eric Spicely. Couldn't agree more about the stylistic matchup or how this thing fares. I'm going to go with uh, Perez, too. I really was thinking about picking Spicely, but as far as this matchup is concerned, I think there are just too many roadblocks uh, in terms of ways for Spicely to get his hand raised. 
So I am going to go with Perez as well. Up to 135 was a, for the fourth fight on the card. Was originally supposed to be. Um, actually, no. It, I thought this fight fell out on one half. Maybe there's been a few cancellations here um, on this card. I guess this was not one of them. Nathan Manis, who I believe was the TKO bantamweight champion, um, is making his UFC debut. Uh, not out of the TK or out of the TKO organization because he did lose his belt before switching promotions and now finds himself in the UFC uh, taking on a former flyweight title challenger. AJ, your thoughts? Yeah, a couple of things really stick out to me here in terms of just pure, purely numbers. Uh, Nate here has a nine inch reach advantage over Ray Borg and he's also six inches taller. So while I do think that Borg is the more polished technical striker, the length and power advantages certainly go in favor of Nate. And that alone could mean he wins the striking exchanges, especially while they're at range. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic there. And then also, obviously, the physicality. You mentioned, you know, Ray is a gentleman who used to fight a flyweight in the past. And while I do think that he could land takedowns at this weight class generally, they're just not going to become as easy for him as, say, they did at flyweight due to that bump up in physicality of these fighters. So um, that, with all that said, I do think that Borg most likely gets his hand raised here. Obviously, he's a more experienced fighter, more tested um, I do think he could land takedowns. Nate's takedown offenses look solid for the most part on the regional tape that I've seen. That said, Borg, I think, is the best wrestler and grappler that he's faced, uh, will be up until this point. And Nate also tends to back himself into the fence, give up the clinch a lot. I've seen him taken down from a, a trip takedown. I think Borg is capable of doing the same. And once Borg gets in top position on the ground, um, I do think that the cardio, the the top control, the pressure uh, will wear on the gas tank of Nate down the stretch. And Borg probably gets his hand raised in a decision scenario because that's typically how he fights. Um, and Nate seems good and tough enough defensively to withstand anything that Borg could potentially throw at him in his debut. Mr. Dorf. Yeah, man. I mean, uh, I have to uh, make sure I say Nate Maness and not Nate Maedas. So uh, <laughs> Nate Maness... Uh, yeah, I mean, he, he has a solid, he looks solid in as far as what, what I saw from him. He defeated Jesse or not, Kaya Mahado. Um, only lost against Taylor Lapalus, who got cut from the UFC. Nobody knows still why. Everybody said he asked for his release. He said definitely not true. So shame on you, UFC. Um, then we have Ray Borg on the other side. Ray Borg is a grinder, man. I always like the style. He goes for the takedown. He, uh, he He's very technical on the ground as well. Uh, stand up pretty good and uh, looked not bad in this Ricky Simone fight last time out. I think that was a candidate for fight of the night, but they gave it to Kelleher against um, what's the what's the other guy again? What was undefeated? What's his name again? Asia, yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm taking Bork here, man. I think Bork will get it done. I think the, the experience of Bork will uh, be big in this fight, although Manus, like you said, has a big injury. Big, reach advantage over him but i think borg will take it to the ground probably try to wrestle with him and uh, takes a unanimous decision home against nathan manus i'm gonna go ahead and go on the opposite side of things here for the first time of the evening even though that didn't work well in my favor last week um i am going to be on the side of nate manus here as we go forward up to 205 pounds Gerald Mearshart, just correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Um, has he fought at 205 in the UFC before? I know he's fought at 205 before he got to the UFC. I'm not sure if he's fought at 205 since. Uh, it's looking like he hasn't. No, he hasn't. So, obviously, just kind of like what Marcel touched on a second ago with Valiev, this fight coming in on somewhat a short notice. I believe um, Mearshart taking this fight um, against Ed Herman, who was supposed to fight. One of the South Korean fighters, Da Eun Jung, was supposed to be who was going to fight Ed Herman. Uh, both of the South Korean fighters that were originally supposed to be on this card are now off. Mearshart steps in. Marcel, go ahead. Take this one away. I mean, this motherfucker has a question, and then t- two seconds later, he, he answers it himself. You, you are like my mother, man. She doesn't answer <laughs> Coming in at me so hot, man. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so uh at herman Gerald Marshall. the thing is with at herman man dude is fucking tough as we all know um but man i mean mercer mercer is good man when he gets you to the ground i think uh the thing with mercer is so far if he gets an opponent which gets him in the top 15 
for some reason he fails, man. I don't know what what's up with that because I think he's a really really good fighter. And he got some bad luck with some decisions, man. I still think he won the Kevin Holland and Eric Anders fight. So, I mean, only the fights where he got finished in the UFC he lost, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion, and nobody gives a fuck about it. That's just that. Um, so Ad Herman, uh, last win, last wins in his two fights. I don't know, man. The, the Ibrahimov fight, man. Ibrahimov has been a total bust in the UFC, man. 0 and three, absolutely not good. Two short notice fights, and that that's true, but still didn't look good. Uh, Ad Herman won. Uh, Ad Herman defeated Pat, Patrick Cummins as well before that three losses. I mean, it's t- difficult to pick because it's at 205, and Ad Herman will probably be more in his place in 205 than Charles Mershaw. But I'm going with Mershaw, man. I think he can catch him with something. So I'm going with Mershaw, third round, TKO, ground and pound. I am too. Uh, I'm going with Mershaw as well before we can get to AJ, just because I'm trying to break this streak of losing consistently when I pick the same person. Last week, when I picked against Carla Esparza, I thought there was no way. There's no way because I had picked against her in her three previous fights. But, hey, and I'm the same way with Ed Herman right now, too. I picked against him in his last two. He's proved me wrong in the last two. Um, Hoping it's not going to be three. AJ, go ahead. Yeah, this is an interesting one because they kind of remind me of, like, each other. Like, (laughs) in a way, like, you know, Herman has fought more times at light heavyweight in the UFC, like you brought up. But he's also fought at middleweight in the past. They're both six feet, one inch tall. They both have 77-inch reach. The significant strike lands per minute are even very similar. Herman, 3.33. Mearshart, 3.31. I'm just like almost looking at the same guy here almost in a you know sarcastic way. And they're also both Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belts. It's interesting because like uh, Marcel said, you could argue that Mearshart won those fights against Holland and Anders. I think that a very solid case can be made. Um, and then unfortunately he ran into Ian Heinisch who caught him with a big shot there. Um, and was able to finish jo- the job there in round one. It's an interesting matchup because they both have generally shown throughout the course of their UFC careers that they end in, uh, they go to fights where they finish. But the way they match up stylistically, considering that they their compelling advantage in a lot of their fights is their Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, but the fact that they're both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts, I tend to think that they're kind of neutralize each other a bit. Um, Mearshart has this tendency of kind of like, getting overwhelmed early on in fights, getting taken down, getting his guard passed, but he's tough and, and good enough defensively to kind of withstand it and sometimes uh, come back from behind and win uh, against like fighters such as Trevin Giles that we'll get to on this card. So they're both, you know, just kind of match up so like similar to each other, to be honest with you. I know Herman's got more momentum. Um, and then you mentioned Mearshart is taking this fight on short notice up a weight class. Um, I'm going to slightly lean with Mearshart here. I just think that he has a bit more uh, ways to win. He's also closer to the prime of his career, I think, of the two. Um, you know, and what I mean by that, bit more ways to win is I think that Mearshart is the one more likely to land takedowns. I think he'll have a bit more success in the striking exchanges of the two. I think uh, despite the short notice, uh, he could potentially uh, win on points down the stretch as the fight progresses. But um, I wouldn't be surprised to see it be, be very, very competitive. Between the two guys, 82 combined professional mixed martial arts appearances. The next highest total on this card between two guys fighting each other, Lando Venata and Bobby Green with 53. So 29 more than the next highest pairing. Frankie Signs and Jonathan Martinez is your featured prelim at 135 pounds. This is something I was happy to see. I must be, I must admit it. And particularly in the corner of Jonathan Martinez, who I think not going to sit here and say he's a future world champion at 135, but I think that this guy has not been given the credit he's been deserved. I mean, the knockout of Ping, Ping Yuan Lu is spectacular, and I was in the building for when he fought Andre Ewell with one of the best seats in the house, and I did not understand how he lost. Um, I thought Martinez surely won the fight. Um, whether people disagree with me or not is up to them. Marcel, go ahead and kick this one off. Yeah, I remember Jonathan Martinez when he came in the UFC. That was the night when I uh, first started playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Then I made this fight announcement. That's why I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, yeah, he has a, yeah, definitely. 
he hasn't uh, looked pretty well, I think. In the, he has looked pretty well in the UFC, man. It's, uh, in four or fights, he won two. And he, like you said, actually should have won three. But yeah, you know what can you do? On the other hand, you have Frankie Sainz, who uh, lost his most recent fight against Marlon Vera. But people will say he won against Marab the Valles Philly. But if you actually saw that fight, in my opinion, I don't use the word of, uh, very of, uh, very many times, but that was one of the biggest robberies I saw that, re- that year. I think Marab easily took that fight 30-27. So, um, yeah, what can you say? I mean, a good fight, I think. I think Jonathan Martinez has the youth. Frankie Sainz is a little bit to the uh, going out of the back door, I think. So, um, I'm I, I'm not going to give any technical uh, thing, uh, the technical explanation here. We left that for AJ. So, I'm taking uh, Jonathan Martinez here for, via what the fuck TKO second round. <laughs> me, me too. AJ, go ahead. Yeah, just like the main event, there's like a wide, wide age gap between these two guys. Um, 13 years difference between Martinez and Sainz. It's crazy, to be honest. Like, we don't see this very much in this game. Um, and like you guys said, uh, I do agree with the fact that Martinez has definitely gotten better since that UFC debut. And uh, we'll get into some other fighters later on. But I do tend to agree that, you know, UFC jitters, like the the adrenaline dump, so to speak, that could get to the fighters. And I think that's evident in a guy like Martinez, who has looked so much better since then. Uh, I do favor him on the feet. I think he's the more durable fighter of the two. Um, a southpaw striker, mainly. Um, another, you know, controversial split decision. I think you can make a solid case that he won that last fight. I do think that he certainly has more momentum. I do think that he's much closer to the prime of his career of the two. So on, on the feet, I do think that he most likely catches signs with a, a shot on the feet and probably wins this fight early, similar to how Marlon Chito Vera did. Um, stylistically though, signs actually kind of presents some problems. Like signs is the gentleman you referred to the Davalos Chile fight. He was at a wrestling disadvantage there, but this one, I tend to think that signs is the better wrestler. Um, and if you look at, you know, some of Martinez's previous fights, he was taken down in his debut by Andre Sukumta. He was taken down by, uh, Ouija uh, Buren as well. So stylistically, Signs could potentially just take Martinez down, get some top control. Um, I consider him, you know, like honestly live in the spot considering the, the threat of the wrestling. Uh, that said, I still am going to lean with the, the younger guy, the guy that I think is close to the prime of his career, the guy that I think that the improvements that we see out of him on a fight to fight basis are going to be pretty pronounced considering his youth and just learning the game and getting more experience. So um, of the two, I, I trust Sign or uh, excuse me, Martinez a bit more. Uh, but wouldn't be surprised to see Signs land some takedowns here. And if this fight plays out for a bit, goes to the scorecards, I could see Signs getting his hand raised. Man. I got Martinez. Go ahead, Marcel. I was thinking, man, when you said Andre Sukumta took him down, I was immediately thinking about the Sean O'Malley fight. He took him down as well. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, but why did he take Mr. No O'Malley one knows. Now. Did anyone ever find out? No, I know Evans was like uh, Evans' teammate was, was was like in the like, dude, I love you, but dude. <laughs> right. That yeah. Really well, funny. I remember seeing that too, and just being like, oh man, but you're his teammate. You're supposed to have the guys back. I don't know if he yeah. if he did that on national television, but I digress. Main card. So this one, as far as the Apex cards are concerned, has some things to see, sink your teeth into. I think going into last week, we made it pretty evident, even though it wasn't anything that wasn't already overly obvious, that nobody had asked for Shogun and uh, Lomog 3, even though it ended up being a pretty a, a pretty entertaining fight. Um, Bobby Green and Lando Venata Q is the second fight on the main card. I think that kind of fits uh, under that same thing. I don't, I don't know who asked for that fight to be ran back, even though the first fight was pretty fun. But before we delve into that one, it is Kevin Holland and Trevin Giles at 185. I know Holland has been saying for, it feels like forever, that his eventual home where he will choose to stay in the Ultimate Fighting Championship is at 170. But here we are again with another matchup between Kevin Holland and a fellow former LFA middleweight, Trevin Giles, on the other side. AJ, your thoughts? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, Kevin Hollins, I was really impressed with how he came out super hot in his last fight. Um, he's another guy that all the skills are there, the talent's there, but sometimes he doesn't always fight with the most urgency. But I really liked how he came in with a good game plan last time, and it, it paid big dividends for him. This is a matchup where I still do think it's winnable for him. 
Um, he was recently promoted to his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt that I found on Instagram under Travis Luter. Super impressive. Happy for the guy. Um, so I tend to think that he has a few different ways to win. On the feet, he's got the reach advantage, uh, seven inches to be exact. So I do think that while these two are at range, he'll have success by just being the more varied striker, landing with more output, um, and just uh, utilizing that length. Uh, Giles, I think, throws with more power. So close up in the boxing exchanges, that's where Giles will have more success striking, uh, though Holland has proven to be very tough and durable. So most likely he can't hurt him. Um, on the ground, though, I think is the equalizer for Holland and ultimately where he potentially could dominate. Um, if you look at Giles's losses and even some of the fights he went on to win, um, he's been taken down. He's been put in various submission attempts. Just his last fight against James Krause, Krause almost submitted him there early on in that fight, hung on to win. Giles is very tough and tenacious, and I do think that he's overall improving. That said, um, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and Kevin Holland, um, I think he does have the potential to take the back here, submit him, similar to how Gerald Mearshart did or even Zach Cummings did. Um, those were guillotine chokes, but basically what I'm trying to say is he could get this up. Um, Giles, though, is live also in the sense that, like, Kevin Holland, the biggest susceptibility I see in his game is that takedown defense. He can be taken down uh, repeatedly. Um, referring to his fight against Gerald Mearshart, he was taken down seven times. Other fights as well. Giles is the more physical guy. I um, think he's the better wrestler of the two. So I do think there's potential for Giles, similar to what I said about John, uh, signs, take Holland down, potentially pass the guard a bit, because Holland does allow a lot of grappling advances for a guy being as uh, highly credentialed in submission grappling as he is, and potentially just kind of win the win the on the cards via top control and uh, just some grappling. So it, this is an interesting fight. I tend to agree with Holland being the favorite because I think he has a bit more ways to win. Uh, but one where I think that Giles can make it interesting, assuming he comes in with a wrestling oriented game plan. This has been, despite the odds, as AJ alluded to, one of the more difficult ones on the card for me to select. Marcel, do you agree? Yeah, definitely. Man. I agree. You want me to go for yes. right. go, oh, go okay. on ahead, brother. Okay, I didn't call that. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, fun fight. I think um, I don't want to talk shit about Kevin Holland, but he got two early Christmas gifts in 2019 with those decisions, in my opinion. After that, he lost to Brandon Allen, but he looked very good in his most recent fight, man, against Anthony Hernandez, where I didn't pick him to win, and he walked through him. So, uh, very impressive. Trevin Giles, I don't think he has looked very good at all in his last three fights, but he did look not that bad against Cummins, but he got caught. He got caught against Gerald Murashad, and the, cross, the James Cross fight was a 50-50 fight. I wasn't too pissed about that decision, to be honest. That's a beautiful stone, what you have there. But uh, I don't know, man. I'm going with uh, Kevin Holland. I think he gets it done. Uh, probably by stoppage, man. I think he pounds him out, TKO, the second round. This is what gives me pause here. It's the fact that what do I look at when I go when I look at these two guys? And I'm trying to make a selection. Where is one of these two guys more susceptible than the other? Cardio, in my opinion. And then I think, who has worse cardio? And then I'm like, ah, I don't know. Both of their cardio doesn't look great. I mean, it, it just it, it could come down, in my opinion, to who has more in the tank later in the fight. Um, and to me, the answer to that is going to be Kevin Holland. And I think I'm going to go with Holland for that reason again. However, this is one of those fights where if I end up being wrong, zero uh, percent level of surprise. I think it's close. I don't think any result would really end up totally surprising me. AJ, I like uh, the facial reactions you're making right there. You got you, you got anything on your mind? No, I love it. It's just one of those who knows <laughs> fights. To be honest with you, like, yeah. I can see it going like too, similar to his fight against Mearshart, where it's like this fifty-fifty fight where there's they're scrambling. One guy's almost about to finish the other, then thirty seconds later, the other guy's grounded pounding the other one. And we just are kind of left in this like no man's land with the whole judging uh, scenario. So that's kind of why I'm laughing because I could see your point. I think there's a legitimate possibility it plays out kind of like that. <laughs> Wasn't the Giles and Kraus fight kind of like that too, in a sense? Like it was kind of just back and forth, the pendulum yeah. swung. Yeah, it'll be it'll Gosh. be interesting. Go now, can, I, can I ask you something? What do you think about? Uh, I said this for a long time, and maybe you agree, maybe you disagree. The judges, man, I think the judges should be placed outside of the event center in a bunker. Okay. No sound of the audience. It's not easy. It's pretty easy right now, but when there is audience again, uh, no sound. Uh, don't tell them which fighter 
is from what place and where they come from. Just show them the two pieces, the, the, the two pieces, the two people. Let them fight and judge. And judge the the if you score a round, immediately sh score show the round, not to maybe not to the fighters, but give it to the how do you say that to Ratner who's there already give it the first round. So you can't like hmm, maybe I like this one more. I can do that. I don't say they do that, but you never know. You know sometimes you see the scorecards which is ten nine. Right. Oh no, now it's nine ten. You know. <laughs> So, I uh, love that idea. I have to say, I love that idea. And if I were to make any alterations to it at all, I would just add one thing to it. Make sure there's no commentary. If they're going to yeah. watch it in those bunkers and they're going to be like secluded in those rooms and they're watching it with no crowd. Think about what really? kind of impact that'll do to guys fighting dudes in their hometowns when fans you, come back. You mean no Dan Hardy? <laughs> well, I mean... Dan Hardy, I, I saw that a lot over the weekend, man. I, I don't know if it's more so – and I was going to reply to you. I think you said yeah. something about the British fighter thing. Is it more of a British fighter thing or more of a cage warrior alum? Yeah, both. Thing? Both, man. Really both, I think. But it was really bad, man, last Saturday. I don't hate Dan Hardy, for example. But uh, he had the same thing with uh, – what was that? I don't know what fight that was. Maybe it was Hooker against Felder last time out. And Mike Biggie Rhodes called him out on it on, on Twitter. And he used my tweet. And since then, Dan Hardy has unfollowed me. So he can't, oh, wow. he, he can't have uh, honest feedback. I mean, for, I, I don't really, I don't dislike to do it at all, you know. But I can give you feedback if I think you, do, you don't do it that great. Who am I? I'm nobody. I know. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm just seeing what I'm saying. And many people agree with me on Saturday night. And the funny thing is, he was very biased on the prelims for the British fighters and the cage warriors ones. And when it was at the main event, the till against Whitaker, he was full on a Whitaker. And I was like, dude, you definitely read the tweets. You definitely did. <laughs> you could you could see how that's totally possible and plausible. But um, don't call yourself a nobody. We don't believe that here on this program. Uh, Bobby as Green. Long, <laughs> as long as you believe that yourself, man, you you can't get uh, you you don't get uh, cocky at all. You know, so that's hey, very important. No, no disagreements uh, from me there. As as we move along to the fight aforementioned at 155 pounds. Like I said, maybe no one was asking for it, but at the end of the day, I'm not going to be too upset about seeing these guys run it back, seeing that their draw at UFC 216 um, was a pretty fun fight to watch. I believe it ended up as fight of the night. AJ, you you sat patiently and quietly for a second. I'll go ahead and let you kick it, kick it off. Yeah, you're right. It did win fight of the night, and that's why I think similar to Nico Price versus Vincente Luque running it back, it's like a, a rematch where it's like basically we'll – the result for the first time was in, wasn't ambiguous, so why are we running this back? Well, it's an awesome fight. So <laughs> that's like the main conclusion, yeah. at least how I feel, that uh, it, it came together. And both guys uh, obviously had to agree to it, and obviously I think that's good. Um, in the first matchup, we saw Lando is certainly having a lot of success early, hurt Bobby in that first round, but made a costly mistake in uh, – landing the illegal knee to a, a downed opponent. Obviously, Lando uh, didn't do it on purpose, completely accidental, just kind of was caught up in the moment going for the finish and uh, caught Bobby with it. Um, and what we had was a, a split draw, the, the rare split draw. Um, you know, for those that aren't familiar, that's one judge, judge scored it for Lando, another scored it for Bobby, and then one judge said, hey, 28-28. So it's an interesting one. They both are high action type guys. And similar to what I was saying before about them is they're, they're so skilled and talented, but sometimes they don't always fight with the most urgency. I remember Davison, you and I were talking about Bobby Green going into his fight against Clay Guida. We pretty much said that he's like the better fighter everywhere, but it's just that, that willingness to just kind of um, not always put his foot on the gas and just kind of fight competitively, just kind of for the sake of it, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, means that like Bobby Green really doesn't pull away from fights that much. And Lando Venata, kind of the same thing, but in a different way. He's a guy that's um, known for expending a lot of energy, going for the early finish. And if he's unsuccessful at doing so, he tends to tire out, like against Tony Ferguson, Matt Favola, other fights as well. The the interesting thing, though, and why I'm hopeful that Lando looks better here than, say, he did in, in previous fights, is I thought he fight, fought a lot more composed in that fight against Yancey Medeiros. That was in New Mexico where he trained, so perhaps the motivation helped um, ignite that. But um, I am I'm hopeful that that type of tendency of Lando carries on to this performance. I do think that he's the fresher guy of the two. And I do think that he's more of a, of a threat to Bobby in the striking exchanges than vice versa. Cause I do think Lando is the more threatening striker. 
Um, and I also trust Lando a bit more to land takedowns. I'm not expecting a wrestling clinic out of him, but if there are takedowns to be landed, I suppose he could land a few similar to how he did in the first one. Um, overall, I'm just going to side with Lando Venata. Um, I think he'll have success early again, assuming he doesn't make a costly mistake and, and lose a point or something like that. I do think that he should win a, a, a somewhat clear but uh, competitive decision. I got Lando here. Um, I It's hard for me to even say particularly why, and I'll let Marcel go ahead and give his piece before I give that reason. So the thing with Bobby Green is he is like Masvidal asked five years ago. I mean, Masvidal also really liked to a little bit throw some punches, walk a little bit like this and this and that, you know what I mean? And not really uh, go straight forward and do anything. But by the way, I, I don't like to see Bobby Green fight and win during this COVID period because he can't do the spray after he won. So that that's really something I really don't like. You guys have no idea what I mean, right? When he wins, he flips the bottle, he sprays the bottle. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, man, I think Bobby Green hasn't looked bad at all in this fight so far, man. I think he is, he's a pretty good fighter. He, the thing is what you said, guys, said he doesn't have the urgency. And that almost cost him, I think, as well against Clay Guida. And the fight he clearly won, in my opinion. But, man, many people like Guida winning as well. So, you know, uh, I think he won. Green definitely won the fight. Lando Venata fight, like you said, he, he fought well against Medeiros. But uh, I don't trust Lando Venata enough, man. And I also really don't trust Bobby Green, actually. So it's a 50-50 fight here. Um, my gut feeling says Bobby Green. So I'm going with the Bobby Green with the closest of split decisions there are. So, uh, yeah, Bobby Green. I like Lando here. I think that, you know, in their first fight, both of these guys had their moments. Um, and again, just kind of like the fight before with Holland and Giles, as I said, it's one of those results that I don't think any – which way it could go would potentially surprise me one way or the other. Um, and we get into kind of the meat and bones here at the top three fights on the card, all featuring uh, at least one uh, fighter in the top 15. Maybe Randy Brown can break his way in there if he scores an upset of one Vicente Luque. I think that there's a potential path to do so, even though I'm not going to make that selection. Marcel, your thoughts on Luque and Brown? Yeah, I love the fight, man. I think it's a very fun fight. Randy Brown announced a fight on his podcast. Um, Luke, uh, Luke looked good in almost all of his fights, but when he got that, got that step up and Stephen Thompson, he didn't look good at all, in my opinion. He got pretty dominated by Stephen Thompson, which is a difficult fight for a guy like Vicente Luke, who likes to, uh, to, to attack the fighter. And Stephen Thompson is really more of a counter striker, in my opinion, but a really on point striker. Uh, Randy Brown has looked amazing uh, in his last fights, man, his last two fights. Uh, defeating Brian Barberina, a guy who almost nobody can stop. He was very impressive in that fight. Uh, Warley Alves, a triangle choke, also very impressive. Man, the thing is, um, I'm going, I don't know what the odds are, but I'm feeling an upset, man. I think Randy Brown can do it. I think Randy Brown can uh, defeat Vicente Luque here, man. I think uh, Luque thinks that uh, that he's gonna he's 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 focused, but I think he's gonna he thinks he's gonna walk through Randy Brown. And the Randy Brown that I saw fighting in the last two fights was really good, also against Nico Price, but he got knocked out from the bottom. But um, yeah, Randy Brown for me, and I think he even finishes him in the third round via TKO. AJ. Yeah, um, I'm on Luke here uh, of the two. Um, I do think that he's more threatening on the feet. I think he throws with more power. Uh, I think he's a more technical striker of the two. But to Marcel's point, Brown is long and, and tricky, and he definitely has looked better in those two most recent fights. That Brian, Brian Barberena finish was super impressive. Um, and I, the concern with Luke is just like the the hitability and striking exchanges. The Nico Price fight, he absorbed. Uh, 129 significant strikes, I believe. The Stephen Thompson fight, he absorbed north of 130. Other fights as well, like Mike Perry, he absorbed north of 80. So that's always the concern with like Luke is that hit ability and striking exchanges. That said, I, I just I favor his durability more of the two. He has been hurt in recent fights, but the reality is he still hasn't been knocked out. And on the ground, I do think he's the much better submission grappler. Um, Morley Alves was beating Randy Brown up until he got tired. And, um, you know, I did notice that Warley Elvis took Brown down, took his back, almost submitted him. 
Luke is a very good submission grappler. I think he could win the fight on the ground on the feet, uh, more threatening um, in those, both of those facets of MMA. I think he has the better round winning tools of the two. Brown can make it competitive, surely, but uh, I'm going to side with uh, Luke. He has more ways to win, I think. I do agree as well. I think the path potentially for Brown where he could catch Luke in some trouble is kind of, you know, apropos, as Marcel mentioned, um, in that kind of similar position, that triangle choke he threw up on Warley Alves, maybe potentially from bottom, Luke setting up in top position, maybe could be somewhere where Brown can utilize his length. Uh, but man, uh, Luke is not going to be an easy guy to submit by any stretch. I do have Luke as well. Um, as we move on to the co-main event, man, this one was supposed to be so many other things in so many other places on so many other cards. I mean, Jennifer Maya and Vivi Arujo, um, uh, future, maybe Vivi Arujo Baker. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, potentially, uh, was supposed to be, <laughs> was, I just love her so much. It was supposed to be the featured prelim on this card. Um, it was actually supposed to be the featured prelim, I think a couple of weeks ago. And then, um, Miss Vivi ended up testing positive for COVID-19. Joanne Calderwood said, screw the title shot, I guess, uh, even though it was never really offered to her. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways you can kind of take take angles at to start this one off. But Calderwood stepping in uh, when she was maybe presumed to have a title shot at 125. AJ, I'll let you start uh, your opinion on that. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned Joanne's decision to take this fight, and I, I do think that um, she definitely is uh, very brave for doing that. This matchup kind of reminds me of Molly McCann versus Talia Santos that we saw not too long ago. Maya playing the role of Santos in that. Uh, yeah, I understand Like Joanne probably should get the better of the striking exchanges. I think she's got the better uh, tools on the feet, especially at range. She fights at the higher pace. I think she could attack the legs really good. The interesting thing, though, is I do think that Maya will be a bit faster than her, and I think she's also more physical. And in terms of purely submission grappling, I do think that Maya is the much better submission grappler of the two. I know Joanne is working on that. She's uh, doing great work. I saw she's got her gi, uh, blue belt on her Instagram. But uh, Maya, I just think, is the much better grappler. I know Maya hasn't shown that. That's always, I guess, the the drawback is Maya doesn't always show that willingness to go for the takedown, pursue uh, the ground attack, but this is a matchup where like, if things aren't going well for her on the feet, she's not uh, winning. Clearly I could see her mixing in some takedowns, uh, some clinch work to work, to get this fight to the ground. Joanne, um, she was taken down in just her last fight by Andrea Lee a few times, taken down in the past as well. Uh, got her back taken by Cynthia Calvillo. That was a while ago, but she really hasn't been threatened by that level of submission grappler since that point. And I do think that Maya poses some similar stylistic troubles in that realm of the fight. So this is one where I understand Joanne being the favorite, but I do think that Maya can make the striking exchanges close enough and potentially win this fight on the ground, assuming she comes in with that game plan. Mr. Dorf, your thoughts? Yeah, I really like that, uh, what AJ said, but I don't know, man. I mean, by the way, uh, Shashanka won't fight until November or December, so that's pretty much why Calder would took this fight. Um, so... It's a hard fight to pick, I think. I mean, I agree with AJ. Uh, Maya has definitely the, inv the advantage in the submission game, probably on the ground uh, overall. Uh, Joanne will have the uh, have the advantage on the on the feet, I think. Uh, she had some some solid uh, Muay Thai, I think. Um, yeah, 50-50 fight again, and it's not a fight I'm really looking forward to, honestly. I think. I would have loved Luke A. Brown on that spot on the co-main event, but uh, I understand it's a high-level women fight. They want to give that extra shine. So uh, I wish they would do that often with the flyweight division for the men's as well, but who am I? Um, so, um, yeah, very close fight. I I'm going with my initial pick. I'm going with Calderwood via decision. But like AJ said, I would definitely not be surprised if Maya uh, wins this fight. Quickly, before we move into the, the marquee main event, I'll ask you guys a quick yes or no question. No. Je a win for Jennifer. <laughs> a win for Jennifer Meyer ultimately sees her unseat Calderwood as the effective number one contender to be, and she will fight Shevchenko next. Yes or no? Yes or no. You say yes. Yes, she will. She will uh, uh, be favorite over Calderwood because she wins. But no, I think they will give it to Calvillo and not to Maya. Gotcha. So you're picking you're picking Maya? No, I'm picking Calderwood to win. Oh, you're but you're asking yeah, you're asking me 
if Maya wins, that she gets yes. a title shot. I think if she wins, she goes she goes up and uh, she goes up in the rankings, but I still think they give it to Colvilio. Gotcha. I'm picking Maya. I'm going with the upset here. As we move into the main event. Uh, what what does AJ say? AJ is quiet. Come on, man. Show yeah, AJ, what, what do you think? I, I think that we see Caitlin Chikagian and Cynthia Calvillo fight for a number one contender. Right. I think that sense. probably makes sense. That yeah. probably makes sense. Um, now on to the main event and I want to give Marcel the floor first here because I know that he said something on Twitter, uh, in response to that, something I said about this main event being three rounds. Uh. Here's the thing about, here's the thing about three round main events for me. I understand them, especially whenever it comes from a position where a main event falls off the card and these guys have been training for three round fights. Obviously, that's understandable. Obviously, that's something where if I were in a position of power, I would grant to the people that request it as well. It makes all the sense in the world. Does it mean I'm going to sit here as, a, as an ultimate fan of the sport and be like, yes, three rounds in the main event? No, like it's just how, that's just how I am wired. Marcel, your thoughts? Yeah, man, you're just a sport little bitch, but that's all good. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just kidding, man. Uh, oh, man. I, I mean, yeah, I, I feel you, man. Uh, five rounds always. That's what Bellator, man, those three rounds is always like, oh, man, it's already over the main event. We would have won the five, you know, and I understand that. But listen, man, if you have signed a contract for three rounds, you got to agree. You got to have an agreement from both sides to go for five. So and that's not always easy to do. I don't know who wanted it. If they don't want it both, I have no idea. Yeah. But it is what it is, man. We have to go with it. And I really don't – I don't think it will really matter because I don't see it go three rounds. But uh, – and on the other hand, man, it, the the main card over here starts at 3 a.m. So fuck off with your five rounds. <laughs> I want to go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to see a quick finish. So I get uh, it, man. <laughs> I, I think there's potential to see one here as well. I mean, you know, the 22-year-old – uh, golden boy, as he likes to call himself, Edmund Shabazi, and really bursted onto the scene in the Contender Series a few summers ago. Um, and, you know, after he got out of the, I believe it was Ultimate Fighter. I was covering Bellator the night this fight happened, so I wasn't watching it live. It was the the Ultimate Fighter finale, um, the heavy hitters finale, where he made his debut uh, against Darren Stewart. And I and I didn't see the fight live because, as I said, I was, I was at a Bellator event. And... So he won that fight by split, and ever since then, it's just – it's been the Edmund Shabazian show every time he has stepped into the octagon. Derek Brunson, you know, while his stock was arguably as lower as it's ever been in the UFC pre his previous two fights, he's bounced back and won two straight. Um, this is a dangerous fight, though, uh, for the wrestling standout, Mr. Brunson. AJ, I'll let you kick this one off. Yeah, just like Signs and Martinez that we talked about earlier on, there's a wide age gap between these two, 14 years. Um, so just purely based off youth, sharpness, and upside, those factors are all going to go in favor of Edmund. Um, and I, I do think, to your point, that Brunson sh certainly has made the adjustments in his two most recent fights. I mean, his wrestling is no joke. I mean, he hasn't been taken down in the UFC, and he's faced guys like Yoel Romero and Ian Heinish. So certainly it checks out. If there are takedowns to be landed, it's going to come from Brunson. My thing is... And to your point, though, is just I do think that Shabazian is going to be a huge threat to Brunson early on in the fight. Um, and I do think ultimately Edmund gets that big shot early on. I really like how Edmund is is fighting methodically. He fights technically. Um, that finish over Tavares was so nice. He just picked a shot so good. I mean, just so much composure out of a young guy. Um, the guy's got all the potential and talent. Um and you look at, you know, Brunson's losses, the culprit to the vast majority of them was getting hurt in a striking exchange. Even his last fight against Ian Heinish. Heinish obviously lost, but Brunson still got hurt by Heinish early on in the fight, obviously went on the recovered. But um, it's been a trend throughout Brunson's career. Like he's very talented, athletic, fast, but like if there's a way to beat him, it's to be a good technical striker and have some power and threaten that durability in a striking exchange. I do think that Edmund poses... Uh, those tools. Obviously, the concern with Edmund is the the fact that he hasn't been tested past the third three minute sixteen second mark of the first round. In fact, the only time he's been pushed was like you said that Darren Stewart Stewart fight. So if this fight goes beyond the the first round, there are some questions on Edmund. I'm just ready to say though that I think his cardio has gotten better since then. That was his UFC debut um, under the bright lights. Just first time that that happened. I do think there's reason to be optimistic that we see his cardio get better. Should he get pushed? Uh, from here on out, I think it was just a learning experience for the for the young man here, and I think we see him make a statement. 
Mr. Dorf. Remember those people who said Atman uh, shouldn't get signed because he was too young after the contender said. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry. That was so funny. Um, I agree. I, I mean, the dude has so much talent, man. I'm, I'm really high on Atman Shabazian. Uh, I, I was... I was really careful in the beginning because I think uh, we always have to be careful with new upcoming talents, young guys. But I think he he showed it in his most recent performances, man. His debut was a little bit underwhelming against Darren Stewart. It was a split decision, I think, in his favor. But since then, man, he, he's on a tier, man. He, he he looked very good. Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson is a very solid fighter, man, but he seems to struggle when he has to go to that next level, man. Uh, and I think Atman is that next level can break into the top five this year uh, if he can keep going like this. Um, give me Atman Shabazian landing a hard shot in the first round and uh, knocking out Derek Brunson. First round, Shabazian. Performance bonus. Seems to be the route a lot of people are going. Edmund Shabazian is the hot hand here, and rightfully so. I mean, guys don't run through, I mean, Jack Marshman, let alone Brad Tavares, the way that he did. And so I'm going to go with Shabazian as well. I think a coming out party um, is definitely in session. For me, Brunson here, I, and I'm not really pointing in the direction of kind of a mental attrition side of things, being the reason for Brunson's downfall. But I see him, at least with the words that he's saying in his body language and in interviews, kind of taking this fight as an, as the same approach as he did with Israel. And I think we all know how that one ended up playing out. I think if he if he thinks Edmund isn't ready um, for this type of shine, I, I do believe my prediction is going to be that he ends up being humbled uh, pretty quickly on Saturday night. That just about does it for this card here as far as our picks are concerned. We just got to make our predictions for the awards. And last week, pretty sure it was pretty difficult not to hit on any of them with six performance of the night bonuses being handed out last week. You always like to see that. Um, Shabazian is going to be my first performance bonus of the night. And my other one, um, my other one is going to go to, let's go ahead and go with Vicente Luque. Marcel. Yeah, pretty obvious Shabazian. And uh, if you pick Randy Brown by stoppage, you should have also, take him as a performance bonus so randy brown as well uh, aj i would go with um marcus perez and edmund shabazian marcus perez and edmund shabazian how about this um i mean if in, in last week our backups did come into play it's gonna be gerald mearshart and uh, i'll go with perez as my backup i'm going with um Kevin Holland. Um Ross as well. AJ? Um Vincente Luque and Jonathan Martinez. As far as fight of the night is concerned, this one is I mean it it, it could come from any which direction. I think um uh, a four performance of the night bonus here could definitely be in order, but I'm gonna go with do we know for a fact, it, has anyone ever gotten fight of the night twice? Like, have, have two guys ever fought twice and gotten fight of the night both times? Do, mm-hmm. we, know that, do we know the answer to that? I'm going to go with, if they haven't, Bobby Green and Lando Venata become the first duo to ever do so in UFC history. If, off the top of my head, I'm correct. I don't know if that's ever happened. I wrote it down, so you don't think I, I do the same as you, but not agree. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. AJ. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Vanada Green as well. Um, it won the first time. I think it has the makings to do it again. I'm definitely going to need to find out because it's going to bother me whether or not that's true, if anyone's ever done it twice. Um, my lock of the night, dude, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people that I can say on this card. I'm just so confident in picking and that I would just like put in the area of lock. I guess Shabazian is as close as I'll get. But I'm not supremely confident in him. I'm decently confident in him. But yeah. Marcel. My luck of the night. Yeah, that's a difficult one, man. Um, yeah. My luck of the night. Uh, uh, um, it's not an easy one. I'm also going with Shabazian, man. It's pretty much. It was either Shabazian or Jonathan Martinez, but I'm going with Shabazian. Yeah, but you get what I'm saying, though. Like, I mean, he's it, 
is he doesn't feel like a lock. I feel confident uh, picking him. I feel confident picking him, but you know, AJ, were you doing locks and underdogs with us, or were you sitting these out? I couldn't remember from last week. I'm sitting these out, but uh, as you're talking, I don't, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but uh, this actually won't be the first fight of the night. Should it go again? Because Rose oh. and Jessica Andrade uh, won it both times, as I just really? found out. That's I just found out. I forgot their first fight was fight of the night. Yeah, what might have thrown it off was because Jessica won fight of the night and she got a performance, kind of like when Masvidal got till. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I would have never, I would have never guessed that that first one was fight of the night. I, I, the second one was great. I would have never guessed the first one was. Um, my underdog of the night's Jennifer Maya. Marcel. Why? Well, who do I have as underdogs? Randy Brown, I believe, is an underdog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, plus well, one fifty-five. Well, who else do I got as an underdog? Um, I'm looking right now. Favorite, 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 favorite. A lot of, I mean, you and I almost went chalk. You like Brown Maya. is an underdog. Maya is an underdog. Bobby Green is an underdog. Bobby Green, he picked, yeah. Yeah, we're that's going with a, Bobby Green. Yeah, that's about it. Going with the king. All right. Well, as we move forward, I know next week we'll have an interesting fight card to break down for you in between um, – in between slipping me at the moment uh, – Lewis and Olenek. Uh, but for this week, we hope you enjoyed this breakdown program. I know that we enjoy doing it. Hopefully you guys enjoy listening as much as we enjoy doing it. We'll be back next week uh, to break down that fight card. Lots of USA versus Russia to get into on there. Uh, but until then, we will see you guys then. Thank you so much. If you like this comment, if you like this content, go ahead, like, subscribe at Dave Bake MMA at Big Marcel 24 at AJ's MMA betting is where you can find all of us and at Loudmouth MMA on Twitter. Until next week, guys, thank you for tuning in.